Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I could do better than that. Good morning, church. <laughs> good. And welcome to those of you watching online this morning. We welcome you here to St. Stephen's Cooperu in uh, sort of sunny Brisbane this morning. My name is Kesh. I'm one of the pastors here at St. Stephen's, and we want to welcome you. If you're new in church this morning, come and make yourself known to us. We'd love to get to know you and connect with you. You can find our contact information on uh, our website is stephenscooperu.com. And we are here to serve you as a church and to help you. This morning, I want you to turn to your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to be in verses 12 to 25. There are Bibles in front of you, in the chairs in front of you, if you want to find one. Or if you're like me, you can't do two things at once because we're not men are mostly not good at multitasking. Uh, then just listen up and uh, just listen to what God wants to say to you and the Holy Spirit. How many of you, so let me start with a question. How many of you are on Twitter? How many of you are on Twitter? All right, quite a number of us on Twitter. Okay, so what is Twitter? For those of you who don't know what Twitter is, it's sort of like a notebook where you can share your thoughts or your messages and the world can see them. And if you're on Twitter and other people read your tweets, as they're called, they are called your followers. Now, I don't know about you, but I wonder if you know this morning who the top five most followed people are in the world. Well, you'd be glad to know maybe that the number, fi number five place, the fifth place, the person who is most followed in this world, the fifth place, is Donald Trump, who has 88 million people following what he has to say. Isn't that amazing? 88 million people. In fourth place is that great uh, football great Cristiano Ronaldo, with 105 million people following him. In third place, it's Justin Bieber, who else could it be, with 114 million people. In second place, it's Elon Musk. We didn't even know who he was a couple of years back. Now he's like one of the most famous people in the world. 123 million people follow him. 123 million. Any of you know who uh, number one is? Anyone? No, actually she's the biggest celeb. Yeah, you go out there, Belinda. But the person in this world who people mostly follow is Barack Obama. 134 million people follow him every single day. Isn't that incredible? Just think about that number. 134 million people are following what his comments are and what his message is for the day. And then if you're not on Twitter, how many of you are on Facebook? Okay, quite a number of you are on Facebook. It would great. If you're on Facebook, send me a friend request. I'd love to connect with you. It's a great way to catch up. You can follow me and I will follow you. But why do I bring up following this morning? Because in our reading today, Jesus calls four fishermen to follow him. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What did it mean for them? And what does it mean for us as a church? As we get ready to reach out to the city and especially in this community of Kuparu, in this new season of church. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, let's dive into the word of God from Matthew chapter 4 and verses 12 to 25. This reading is, is almost in three sections, uh, and we'll go through those three different sections as we go along. The first section is verses 12 to 17. And this teaches us what our Savior is like and what we are called to be like as we follow him. That Jesus goes into the darkest places. He goes into the darkest places and he brings light. Verse 12 and 13 says, Now when Jesus heard John had, John had been rested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth, the place he'd grown up, his hometown, and he made his way to Capernaum. And then 14 and 15 verses say, So what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, that in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, to the galley of the Gentiles. Now, why is this important? Why does the Bible writer put that in? Because when it talks about the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, we need to understand that during the time of Jesus, this was a very dark region. I mean, this was, loads of darkness was there. I don't mean like in terms of light and dark, but sort of a lot of evil was there. A lot of bad things were there. In those days, this was known as a, a demonic stronghold. This is the same place where Jesus confronts the demon-possessed man in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 5. You might remember that story, but it's a story where Jesus sees this demon-possessed man and he says to him, what's your name? 
And the man replies, or the demon replies, Legion, for we are many. Some of you remember that story? Yeah, okay, well done. Uh, so Jesus casts out these demons in this man, and they go into the pigs. Do you remember that part? And they go out over the edge and drown, okay? You could say it was the first incident of deviled ham. All right, get it? <laughs> but in verse 16, Matthew reminds us what this area was like. He's, this is 700 years before this actually happened. Isaiah wrote that the people who sat in darkness, and Matthew says this in verse 16, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. What does that mean? It means that new hope had come, a new light had dawned on these people who had been living in this dark region of Israel. Not only had God said he was going to do this 700 years before, but now he was doing it in and through Jesus. John 1.3 says this about Jesus. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never overcome it. And this is what light does. It pushes the darkness back. I mean, if you go to your backyard at night time and you flip on the light, all of a sudden on the ground, what do you see? What do you see? Cockroaches. Grass. Well, nice one, yeah? You do see grass. Well done, yeah? You do. Well, you've got a gra backyard with grass. But you will see cockroaches, yeah? I hate cockroaches. How many of you hate cockroaches? They're horrible, horrible creatures. I'm sure they weren't supposed, I'm sure they're part of the fall and should have been, shouldn't have been there with mosquitoes and the rest of the things. But, but you flip the light on in your backyard, and what do cockroaches do? What do they do? They run away, they scurry. And this is what's happening in Zebulun, Naphtali, and the Galilee of the Gentiles, when Jesus goes into this region, that demons start running for their lives. That in the midst of this dark place, where people have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, living under this dark atmosphere, Jesus brings hope and Jesus brings light and I think it's the same hope that we are in need of today isn't it I think we're all in need of this glimmer of hope because there's still plenty of darkness in our world today just read your morning newspaper look at the evening news and you'll quickly find we live in a world that is oppressed by spiritual darkness people who feel completely lost people who feel powerless people who feel hopeless, homeless, broken, trying to cope with past traumas, people who are depressed, suffering from anxiety, sadness, there's fearfulness, there's anger, there's tired, there's people who are burnt out, out of touch with the God who wants to give them life in all its fullness. And what does Jesus go on to show us? That the light has dawned, that a new hope has come, that something new has arrived. In verse 17, he says this, from that time, so from the moment that the light had dawned, from the moment that Jesus arrived in this area, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? Repent means to change your way. So if you were going this way, and you're heading in disaster, God is saying, turn your life around and start going here, that way, towards God. It's a turnaround. The word repent in the original language means to, a turnaround. To, from where you were going back to where God is asking you to go. So that's repent. And then it says, uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? Well, that's simply a phrase to, to encapsulate uh, God's rule, uh, God's reign, God's ways. And then it says, is at hand, which means it's within your grasp. It's, it's so close to you. And if you can imagine in those days when Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is closer to hand, he literally was there in front of them. So it was very close to him. They could grasp it for themselves. And this is the word, message that the world still needs today. This is the message that the people around us still need to hear. And we, as followers of Jesus, are called to bring that light and that hope into their lives. As Jesus says to Paul, in Acts 26, I'm sending you to open the eyes of the outsiders so they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light. 
so they can see the difference between evil and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family of God, inviting them into the company of those who begin to live by believing in me. That's in Acts 26. That's Jesus talking to Paul and his mission for this world. And so saying for us, if we're following Jesus, if we say that we are disciples of Christ, then his mission becomes our mission. So then the call is to us. Are we ready to shine God's light within us to this world, to this community, to the families that we live in, to the places that we work? What does it mean to shine your light? What does it mean? We use that phrase so often and say, well, you should shine your light. What does it mean? Well, to shine your light is to live, first of all, in such a way that others can see Jesus in us. Secondly, that we, we reflect his character and love in all that we do. That we are people of integrity who others can trust. That we are kind and compassionate, patient and forgiving. And we live our lives in such a way that we point others to Jesus Christ. So just think about that. How well are you doing in those areas? Ask yourself that. Am I living in such a way that others can see Jesus in me? Do I reflect his character, his love, and his truth in all that I'm doing? Am I someone others can trust? Am I compassionate and patient and forgiving with people? Am I living my life in such a way that I'm pointing others to Jesus? Ask yourself those questions, because that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus Christ, to live in a way that shows Jesus to this world, to shine as a light as Jesus shone in the dark places. Jesus goes into the darkest places to bring light, to bring hope. We're called to do the same. Are we ready as a church to do the same? So that's the first part of this reading. Jesus goes into the dark places and he brings light. The next part is in verses 18 to 22. And what we learn about Jesus in these verses is that he chooses average people and he makes them into great leaders. He chooses really average people and makes them into great leaders. I mean, check out the verses in 1820. As Jesus walks by the Sea of Galilee, sees two brothers, Simon and Andrew, and he says to them, follow me and I'll make you fish for people. In, or some translations say, I'll make you fishers of men. And immediately they leave their nets and they follow Jesus. Then he goes on a bit further and he sees James and his brother John. And they're with their dad and immediately he says to them, follow me. And they leave their boat and their father and their nets and everything and follow him. Jesus chooses average people and he makes them into great leaders. I mean, if you were... If you think about it, for those of you who work in business, if you're instructing someone on how to put together the perfect leadership team, you would probably look at Jesus' selection and think, Jesus, are you sure about this? Are you kidding me? Fishermen? I mean, think about it. At that time, fishermen were not the most educated individuals, not the most sophisticated, not the brightest of the bunch. They were kind of smelly and stinky because we were out in the water all the time. And they had, what well, a lot of fishermen still do, have a tendency to exaggerate, yeah? Where's my fishermen in church this morning? You're not going to show yourselves, are you? But don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, you should have seen the size of that fish that I caught the last week. Yeah, you know it was just a minnow, really. <laughs> so Jesus looks at these fishermen, though, these average people, these these what people would have said at the time, good for nothings. And he says, follow me. Kind of like, I don't know whether you know the story of Gideon in the book of Judges in chapter 6. But when God calls Gideon, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon in, in Judges 6. And, and he says to him, oh, mighty man of valor. And Gideon at that time is hiding in a wine press. He's hiding. He's afraid of people. And yet, the angel of the Lord goes to him and calls him a mighty man of valor. And, and Gideon's like, well, who are you talking about? Can't you see that I'm afraid and I'm hiding in this place? But what we see in the scriptures is that God calls things that are not as if they already were. 
God calls things that are not as if they already were. What does that mean? That God doesn't call you what you are. He calls you what you can become. So you need to stop comparing yourself and disqualifying yourself. You need to stop seeing yourself through the eyes of people and begin to understand who you are in the eyes of God. That God can take average people and make them into great leaders. I'm sure there were people standing there by the beach that day looking at Jesus calling these fishermen and thinking, they never make to anything. Those guys, absolutely useless. But three years later, Jesus hands the guidance of the whole future church into the hands of these average people and they turn the world upside down and the right way up. Jesus chooses average people and he says to them, follow me. And that phrase, follow me, was a rabbinical saying. What does that mean? It's, it's, it means that if you were a rabbi in the days of Jesus, you would say, I want that person. I look at somebody's life and I think, you know what? There's something about that guy. I want that person or that, or that young man to be my follower. I want him to follow me, to stay with me, to understand my way, to understand my principles and my way of living. And I want him to do that. And so when Jesus says, follow me to these fishermen, they knew what he was asking for. They knew that he was asking them to give up everything that they knew to be life and follow him. Leave it all behind. And what I love about these fishermen, these men, is that they respond immediately. They didn't say, oh, hold on, Jesus, let me make a list of pros and cons and I'll get my assistant to call you back later in the day and tell you if we think it's a good idea. They don't even ponder it for a second. The Bible says they drop their nets and they walk away from everything and they're all in. Church, our culture wants a cost-free Christianity. It wants, to, it wants all of what Jesus has to offer, but it wants to give very little back to him. But when Jesus calls us to follow him, he calls us to lay down everything that would hold us back that would spoil the way of following him. He wants 100% Christians. Church, as we go out into these dark places, part-time Christians cannot defeat full-time devils. You hear what I'm saying? Part-time Christians cannot defeat full-time devils. So what is it in your life? What is it in your life right now that's in the way of you giving 100% to Jesus? Think about that. What is it that's stopping you from giving your whole self into the ministry and life of Jesus? For the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, it was all his possessions. He said to Jesus, look, I follow all the commandments. I live my life in that way. And Jesus says to him, you need to sell everything and follow me. Why did he say that? Because he knew. For Jesus knew that those things, those riches were holding him back from living the life that Jesus wanted him to live. What is it for you that is stopping you giving 100% to Jesus today? That's holding you back. Because the command of Scripture is this, not for you to ponder it. It's not for you to chew over it or, or say, oh, I've got a special deal with me and the big guy upstairs. No, the command of Scripture is right now. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 said, today is the day of salvation. And what does it mean by that? You might not have tomorrow. You have to make that decision today. Joshua says at the end of his ministry, Joshua 24, choose you today who you are going to serve. It needs to be 100%. We need to be all in. We're starting a new sermon series in a few weeks' time called Wholehearted. Why? Because we want to, as a church, be wholehearted as we begin this new journey, as we begin to reach out into this community and to this wider city. We need to be all in with Jesus for him to work through our lives and to reach people who are living in darkness. Jesus is calling you and I to follow him and to fish for, to catch the hearts and souls of men and women for him. How do we do that? How do we catch people's lives? How do we win people over to Jesus? Well, two things. Using fishing, find where the people are. You know, if you're a fisherman, you don't catch fish in a barrel. You have to go where the fish are. And this is true of the good news of Jesus as well, that we need to go to the people. So often the church has got into a habit, and I don't just mean this church, but church generally, 
of wanting people just to come through the doors. And church, that was never the mission of Jesus. His mission was always for us to go out of the building and go into the community. And so we need to be a people who just don't meet on a Sunday morning and expect people to come to us. But we need to find opportunities in this community to reach out with the love of Jesus. So we need to go where the people are. There are people who don't know Jesus all around us. You probably have some in your family. You probably have a neighbor that you speak to every single day. You probably have co-workers or friends. These are all the people. Many of them will be living in really dark lives, situations that you don't even know about, who need to hear the good news of Jesus, that need the light and hope what Jesus offers. So first thing we do, we need to go where the people are. Secondly, we need to bait the hook and cast the net. What does that mean? That too often as Christians, we, we share the gospel and we want to play the short game. We, you know, we hook the bait and we throw it in the water and we try to speak to somebody about Jesus, but if they don't bite at it straight away, we tend to just walk away from it, move on. Friends, while I don't know a lot about fishing, I do know that fishing takes a lot of patience. You can't just rush the process. Most fishermen will tell you that they're out on the water for hours, not just a few minutes. But the point is, don't just tell those in your circle about who Jesus is and the life of what Jesus has done for you and leave it there. But live it out in front of them. Live it every single day so they're not only talking about it, but they can see by the way that you are who Jesus is. This is the long game that we do as God's people. we patient. So Jesus teaches us, if we're going to be followers of his, we do what he does. He goes into dark places. He brings light. Secondly, he uses average people and does, makes them into great leaders. But thirdly, and this is the third section of this reading, is verses 23 and 25. The third section, he teaches us that he ministers to the neediest people. And you'll find that right the way through scripture, that God has a love for those who are least, for those who are homeless, for those who are widows, for those who are orphans. Do we have that as God's people? Are we looking out for those people in our community? Verses 23 and 25. Jesus was about Galilee, teaching in synagogues, preaching the gospel uh, of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses. He goes through Syria and people afflicted with disease, diseases and torments, demon-possessed people, epileptics, paralytics, and he heals them. Now just picture that. Remember, this is Church 30 AD, okay? You've got thousands of people coming from this whole region, all over the place, with every sickness imaginable. And this is what Jesus does. He touches them. He heals them. He restores them. He liberates them. And he lifts them up. That's what he came to do. And that's what he calls us to do. That's what church is about. We are here to build people up, to lift people up, to touch people's lives, to pray for healing, God's healing upon, to restore people, help them to restore it to liberate them from the places that they find themselves in and to lift them up, build them up. That's what we need to do as church as we move forward. And I wonder, if you think back while this is happening, I wonder what the conversation was like. I mean, they would have been talking with each other as they're queuing up to see Jesus or maybe afterwards that they're just coming back after they've seen him. And some people would be saying, what, 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 what did he do? What did Jesus do for you? And he's like, mate, I was so demon-possessed. And I was so sick. But Jesus touched me and he set me free. And somebody else would say, well, guess what? I had this thing called leprosy and parts were falling off me all over the place. And, and nobody wanted to be around me, not even my family. But he embraced me and he brought me to himself. He showed me what life was. Can you imagine all those conversations going on and the effect that they would have had on those people who were waiting to go and see Jesus? What has Jesus done in your life? What has Jesus done in your life that you can share with other people? Because church is all about people who've been touched by Jesus Christ. And then they go out and tell others, you know the stories of the healings of Jesus. These people, Jesus says to them sometimes, don't tell anybody that I've done this for you. But they can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. Can you help yourself? After all that Jesus has done for you, do you stop yourself from telling people exactly what he's done? 
Friends, Jesus did not give a mission to his church. He formed a church for his mission. Do you get that? Jesus did not give a mission to his church. He formed a church for his mission. And without the mission, if we're not going out and making disciples, a church is not a church. It's just a group of Christians hanging out on a Sunday morning. That's all it is. And so can I challenge us today. What has Jesus been doing in your life lately? And what great story do you have to share about Jesus with those around you? Because get ready, church. Here we are. Here is where God has placed us in this community, on the edge of this city, in this dark place, where people around us are living in darkness. Let's be like our Savior. Let's go into it. Let's be a light. Let's shine for his glory. Get ready, church. He hasn't chosen the brightest. And I know what you're thinking. You're looking at me thinking that's the truest thing you've said this morning. (laughs) He hasn't chosen the brightest or the most sophisticated. But guess what? He's able to do great things through simple people like us. And isn't that what we want as church? Don't we want to be that church, St. Stephen's Kupuru, to look like Jesus Christ? Do we? Do we? Yes. So Jesus calls you and me to join him in this mission. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. St. Stephen's Kupuru, let's go out, filled with the Spirit of God, bringing light to this broken and dark world. Amen? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is true. I thank you that your word shows us the way. And I thank you for the life that only your word can give us. Father, we want this church to look like your Son, our Savior. We want our lives to look like him. We truly want to be followers 100% in. Would you show us where we are failing in our lives, where we're holding back? Show us, Lord, what it is that is stopping us coming fully to you. We want to be fishers of men and women. We want to be able to share the good news of Jesus with our families and friends and people at work. God, would you give us opportunities to do that? God, we pray that this church will simply reflect the glory of your great one, Jesus Christ. That we would be people who would go out into the world and shine his light in the darkness. That we would be people known by our love. Father, that that people would look at us and see love. That we love them as you love us and as you love them. And Father, we know that what we are asking you this morning is a tall order. We know that it's difficult for us to do. And we know there's a big prayer to ask as a church. But we know that you're a big God who is able to do more than we could ever imagine, more than ever we could ever think with us, Lord. And this morning, Father, we say to you as church, here we are, Lord. Send us. Send us into this community. Send us into this world. Send us into this city to bring light into these dark places. Use us, Lord, we pray. And Father, that is my prayer for this church. That is my prayer for my church family gathered here today, for this year. Help us to faithfully follow Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.